Good morning, I'm Reverend Rhonda Hobbs and I would like to welcome you to Colonial Heights United Methodist Church on this Sunday morning. Whether you are worshiping with us online or if you'll worship later in the week, know that you are in our hearts and prayers and that we are glad you've chosen to worship God our Savior this morning. Let us pray. God, as we gather together as Christians, as family, remind us that what we have in common is not the way we look, not the way we dress or the way we act or even the way we think, but what we have in common is you, your love for us, our love for you, and a truly heartfelt desire to worship and to serve you more each day. Be with us this morning as we learn and grow together. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again, everyone. Let's stand together, and if you'll grab your United Methodist hymnal and turn to page 98, we'll sing the first and third verses of To God Be the Glory. Praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. 
as we go to God in prayer this morning and as we shared our announcements and I thought about everything going on in our lives and in the lives of the church, my mind started going round really fast. Anybody's mind going like really, really fast with all the details of last week, all those who might be sick, those who are on vacation, those who are traveling, those who are making plans to travel vacation. It's supposed to be vacation. It's a lot of work. How about if we just stop? We'll open as we pray with a big, long, deep breath and a moment of silence. Let us pray. God, your word tells us to be still and know that you are God. In our being still, we know that we are not God. In being still, we can center ourselves, make choices and decisions about what really is important in life. It's in our being still that we can hear your still, small voice guiding and directing, coaching us, encouraging us. It's in the stillness that we can breathe deep into the Spirit, breathing back what you first breathed into us. It's being in still that our bodies can rest that our minds can come to a place of peace so that we're not anxious, angry, and hurried all the time. As Jesus modeled for his disciples and for us today, we need to take time to get away, a time to be alone, a time to hit the reset button, God, we thank you for these lessons and these teachings and all the many things that Jesus has left us to remember that he said while here on earth as we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's all stand together to sing. Uh, we're going to make a slight change. We're going to start with number 715 in the United Methodist Hymnal. Let's rejoice the Lord is King. And then we'll still sing a verse of Be Thou My Vision after that. Rejoice the Lord is King. Go to the celebration. 
celebration hymnal number 562 and we'll sing the first verse of Be Thou My Vision. offering. As you know, we have been, myself and Leah, your delegate, and Del Holly, our par parliamentarian, have been to annual conference this week. Leah will be sharing in the coming days more of what happened, but I'm going to steal just a tiny bit of thunder. There were over 4,788 buckets collected in our conference to go abroad. Give God a hand clap and praise. The district far exceeded our expectations. The foundation is going to be funding our camps to the tune of a million and a half dollars. You'll be hearing more about that. And one very generous couple started it off with a, a gift of $10,000. Our conference is alive and well. The spirit there was the best that I have ever experienced in 20 years. Yeah, bring tears. Um, all of us were before we left. Um, God is good. And it's because of you and your generosity that we are still in the business of transforming the world for the sake of Jesus Christ. Our offering plates are here at the front, or you may leave your gift as you leave this morning. Tis our gift to be simple, tis our gift to be free, tis the gift to come down where you ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, will be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to have and to bend, we shan't be ashamed to turn. Turn will be our delight, and by turning, turning, we come round right. Tis the gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free, tis a gift to come down where you ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, twill be in the valley of love and delight. Rend your hearts, rend your hearts and not your garments, for your transgressions, even as Elijah has sealed the heavens. Through the word of God, I therefore say to ye, forsake your idols, return to God, for he is slow to anger and merciful and kind and gracious and repenteth him of all evil if with all your hearts ye truly seek me ye shall ever surely saith our God, if with all your heart ye truly seek me, ye shall ever surely find me, thus saith our God, thus saith our God. 
might even come before his presence. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might even come before his presence. the loaves and the fishes, we ask that you would multiply our gifts, our tithes, and our service so that your kingdom might come on earth as it is in heaven. Bless these gifts in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And watch those because they roll. Thank you. So last week we started a new sermon series entitled The Five Marks of a Methodist, and it's based off of this little book by the Reverend Dr. Steve Harper. And I will before we're done for the five marks, you'll get a pop quiz, but not this morning. It's still early and it's raining, so I'll tell you what those five marks are again. The marks of a Methodist are they love God. And if you'll remember, that works both ways. We know that God loves us, and therefore, in return, we love God. Rejoices in God. Gives thanks to God. Prays constantly. And fifth is love others. I take pride in the fact that I am a United Methodist. We are not perfect, but we're solid. We are founded on Scripture. We are expected to use our reason. We fall back on the values of tradition. And we know that if the Bible says it, we can experience it as God's promise. I want you to be proud of your United Methodist history and faith. And today we will look at Rejoices in God from Nehemiah. Nehemiah, the eighth chapter, I'll be sharing in verses 9 through 12. 
And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all of the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet wine and send portions of them to those for whom nothing has been prepared. For this is the day that is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing, because they had understood the words that were declared to them. This is the word of God for the people of God. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Again, we have that double meaning. God gives us his joy so that the joy that belongs to God also belongs to us. But as we are reconciled to God, our strength and our joy build us up as Christians. So what gives you strength? Just in your day-to-day -day life. Well, what's the opposite of strength is when you don't have it and you wake up and you feel weak and you say, I did not have my Wheaties. Do you know how hard I had to look to find this box of Wheaties? <laughs> Down on the bottom shelf in one row. I, had to go I actually Googled, do they still make Wheaties? I thought I was going to have to find another illustration this morning. But Wheaties, they're advertised and marketed that they give us strength and build us up. Food is our sustenance. So what does a Christian eat? God's Word. Eat it as if it were a good, fine steak if you're a meat eater or cauliflower if you're not. You eat God's Word the way you would a steak. Now, if you try to cram an eight-ounce steak in your mouth all at once, what's going to happen? You're going to choke on it, right? You take small bites, and if you really want to know if it's a good steak, you chew it the way a cow chews its cud, very slowly, very purposeful, and very intently. That's the way we are to read God's word for strength little sections at a time, just a piece, just a piece of it. But savor it, chew it slowly. Let it get down into your skin. Imagine all day today, chewing on the words, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Every time you breathe in, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Are you going to have a good day today if you do that? If you do it often? Yeah. Who knows, before it's done, you might actually be joyful. These are, these make us strong. We talked about autoimmune stuff last week, but these will be, help you to be strong, right? You know what they are? If you can't see, they're vitamins. Do you know what the very best vitamin a Christian can take is? Bingo. B1. The odd thing about the vitamins when you check them out is they're not as hard to find as the Wheaties. There is a whole 12-foot section of four or five rows of all different kinds of vitamins. You can get the same vitamin in a tablet or the gummies. I went for the gummies. All kinds, and also, just so that you know, I got the 50 plus. So it's, and it's for women. So it's custom made for me. Not only are we to be a Christian, we're to recognize that we're all different. We're all different. If they can make that many different vitamins to attune to what our bodies need and our minds, 
maybe we should also allow for that room in our beliefs. Just a thought. Now, when I thought about building strength, this is the first thing that comes to my mind. These, yeah. And I got to get them out of the garage. <laughs> and I had to dust them off. And if I do this anymore, somebody else is going to have to serve communion besides me. You see, when we do weights, do we start out bench pressing 500 pounds? No. If we're going to build strength, no matter what it is, whether it's joy or muscle, we start out a little bit at a time. Start out with the low weights. If you're a newbie Christian, you start out with a little bit, and you build with time, and you don't have to look very far because life will give you weights to carry all on its own. If you're a new Christian and you've got trouble carrying a weight, reach out to another Christian. Make sure you've got somebody to spot you, right? When you lift weights, you need somebody to spot you. But if you've been a Christian your entire life and you start wobbling back and forth at the slightest breeze, maybe you need to be a little more intentional and practice a little bit more often on lifting the weights. Um, you can also practice that by prayer, by the way. Prayer is the way that we strengthen our muscles as Christians. Prayer is not about giving God a Santa Claus list that says, I want, I need, I want, I need, I need this, I want that. If your children or your spouse talk to you the way most of us talk to God, how deep is that relationship? How substantial is it? Try this. Go shopping. I went, to, I went carming or junking, treasure finding on Friday. But I was in my head more than I was shopping. And I knew that God was with me. Invite God to go with you to the grocery store. And be aware of God's presence. Listen for that voice. If the prices in the grocery store irritate you, tell God, isn't this ridiculous? God has a sense of humor. Trust me, I have laughed more in the last 48 hours than in a long time, just because it's funny. When I get angry at drivers and I call them names, then God calls me out for it. And I said, but I didn't say this. I could have said that. Have a conversation. Let your prayer life be constant, and we'll talk about that in the coming weeks, but let it be conversational, as if you are talking to your best friend, because you are. The joy of our strength is in the Lord. The joy of our strength is in the Lord. Wesley says that joy stands on its very own as a distinctive evidence. Joy is evidence that we follow Jesus. How many joyful Christians do you see? I see a lot that, as they say, were baptized in lemon juice. But joy should be a leading mark after love the world should know us by our joy. So how does joy of the Lord make us stronger? We're doing C's this morning. In case you want to keep up, there's five. Unless I come up with another one between now and the end of it. Joy makes us stronger because we are confident. Did you know that you can be confident that you are a beloved child of God, that your name is written, as they say, on the Lamb's book of life, that you have abundant life here and now in this very moment. You do not have to wait until you get to heaven. I would advise you not to wait until you die to get to know God or to appreciate the abundant life that you have. You can be confident and that confidence that you are a beloved child of God will bring joy. Even when you're not happy, you will have joy. 
The other thing that you will have is courage. Courage. Because the Bible says, perfect love casts out fear. That might be another little snippet you want to chew on, depending on what's going on in your life today. Perfect love. God's perfect love within us, not our ability to love perfectly, but God's perfect love living within us will cast out all fear. Harper says, as long as we evaluate our Christian life or our life at all in terms of what other people think of us, we're going to play it safe. We're not going to do everything God calls us to do because I will tell you, God calls us to do some ridiculous things every now and then. And if we base our life on other people's opinions of us, we will never accomplish all the things that God has in mind for us. We will play it safe, and that is living in fear. Perfect love is the beginning of courage. Courage is rooted in love, and that courage, being able to be courageous, fills us with joy. The couple that gave $10,000, he's a pastor. He's not a millionaire. He didn't live life in corporate America. He is retired. To my knowledge, he didn't inherit from a wealthy family member. And yet he courageously, he and his wife, courageously gave $10,000 to something they believed in. And there's a whole lot of folks that would call that crazy, but I call it courage because they trust in God. Trusting in God will give us courage. Now, I have also seen some folks that had courage. They had courage to stand up in a crowd and shout to the rafters and get in people's faces to just tell them just exactly the way things are. That's not the kind of courage Christians need to have, especially right now. Courage is not being an obnoxious bull in a china shop spirituality, or is it living your life with your nose in somebody else's face, telling them how things are? That's not the kind of courage that joy is going to bring to us, nor is it the kind of courage that's going to bring joy. Instead, we're to live in a joyful peace, Harper says, knowing that when we are faithful to God, we are living not only as God intends us to live, but doing it in the right spirit. Because if you'll remember, everything begins and ends in love. Joy is a byproduct of love. Now, the third C to exercise your joy is contentment. Chasing happiness will steal your joy every single time. The verse of the song, Trust and Obey, says, Being happy in Jesus, for there's no other way. Being content, yes, in what you have, but also with who you are with who you are as an individual, to be content with where you are in the moment and who you are in the moment. Now, contentment is not the same thing as complacency. Contentment has this anticipatory hope and trust in God that as things need to change, they will. God working through God's Spirit will motivate you, will lead, guide, and direct you when it's time. But be content in this moment. Contentment uses the strength of a confident hope in God to move forward as God wills and God calls us. It's li not living a re restless, frenetic pursuit of people or things but living in an ease, content with whatever the present moment is bringing to us. We learn to trust God. If you are a planner, if you are an overachiever who really likes to plan, 
You wake up in the morning and you've got your calendar. Well, there's a real interesting thing that happens when you're a pastor, maybe not in your life, but in mine. I have my plan all laid out. And before item one is done, at least 18 other things have happened. And do you know what I've learned over the 20 years of ministry? Go ahead and plan, but hold it lightly. Hold it lightly. And realize that whatever comes is not an interruption, but part of the calling for that day. It is part of it. And you learn to be content and not anxious. You learn to let things go. And you learn to listen. And you learn to be a little more at ease. Our joy is in the Lord who made heaven and earth and earth all that is within it, I believe he can organize my day. The other C is communion, as in community. More and more voices are acknowledging the fact that we are in another pandemic. You know what this one is? Loneliness. Countless people, high percentages, if you just Google loneliness, it is of epidem- or pandemic proportion in our country and around the world of people who are lonely. And yet God is a triune being. God said it is not good for humans to be alone. God calls and creates us to be community. And at the same time, God is also our constant companion and our comforter. God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we know that God loves us and we love God. And, but did you know you can have the assurance of that, that you're reconciled to God and that being at one with God is a source of our joy? The fact that we come together as a community of faith, the fact that God has called us to serve the community around us means that we were meant to be together. We are better together than we are alone, right? One plus one does not equal two. One plus one is greater than two when you're part of working together be it at church or even at the job or at school. Communion and community are always greater together. It's that power of multiplication. Something mysterious happens when two come together that is so much more than just one. And the last C is commitment. Commitment. It almost hangs in our throat right now. Most of us can't commit to having lunch at noon. But we're called as Christians to commit. We commit to one another in community. We commit to this community in service and in love. We have made a commitment to God to represent Jesus in this world. Harper writes, to move from Christianity, as good as it is, I mean, excuse me, churchianity, as good as that is, to Christianity. Me, being a Christian is a 24-7 commitment. We move from membership, as good as that is, to discipleship. Learning at the feet of Jesus, who is the master. So if you want more joy in life, maybe the place to start is not with the accumulation of more stuff or more power, more things, or more friends. Maybe the source of your joy is in God. And to go deeper with God, to go from being this vague thing to being extremely specific. Harper says it this way, 
It's not just the life of God in the human soul, but the life of God in my soul. God's life within your soul. See, Wesley, when he came to Georgia as a missionary, met up with a Moravian minister by the name of August Spangenberg. And in their discussion, Spangenberg asked Wesley, do you know that Jesus is your Savior? Wesley replied, I know that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Spangenberg didn't let it go. Do you know? Do you know that Jesus is your Savior? Wesley nodded, but then later wrote in his journal, I fear those words were vain. The Spirit of God began to move in Wesley's heart, showing him that God isn't interested in a vague, impersonal relationship, but God is interested in a heart-to-heart, life-to-life relationship. The scriptures say, Whom do I have in heaven but you, O God? And there is none upon the earth that I desire but you. My God and my all, you are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Harper points out that a life in Christ that includes being a part of the church, but it must transcend an institutional identification. In other words, yes, I may be Methodist, but before I am Methodist, I am a child of God. Before you identify with a label, an institution, you must be a child of God. It is the joy of our strength that comes from God. And it is through these C's, this being of contentment, this idea of communion and being in community with one another, that is designed to bring us joy. How's your level of joy this morning? How is your strength? We'll put away the Wheaties, and we'll put away the vitamins, and we'll put away the weights, because it is this meal that Jesus gave to us to remind us. The very name communion reminds us that we are community. The very act of the meal reminds us that we are to serve our community. And the words remind us of the price that our joy is given to us. If you would, I'm going to be sharing this morning from a great Thanksgiving for the season after Pentecost, um, the, your part that's on page 13 of the great Thanksgiving will be the same. That's what's in bold. This table belongs to Jesus Christ. It transcends institution and denomination. It is a holy place where we come to eat with our Lord Jesus Christ and everyone is welcome at this table. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image. And you breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. 
And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, God, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, his death, his resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the body of Christ, broken and given for you. If there was no one else, still broken and given for you. <coughs> one of those little mints. Thank you. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, <clears throat> Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Gordon, if I could ask you to be usher. Sonny is out. As you know, Judy had surgery. And if you would go ahead and usher, and you will come up. We will be serving by intinction. We also have gluten-free, if you would like that. And when we serve by intinction, the bread is broken and given to you. And we will tell you that this is the body of Christ. And this is personal. This is not vague. Liz, this is the body of Christ, broken and given for you. This is the blood of his new covenant shed for you. If you would come.
Let's all stand together one more time and we'll sing the first and fifth verses of number 553 in the celebration hymnal, Nearer My God to Thee. Uh... 
be quick. This week I had lunch with Liz and Lisa and we were talking about our children's ministry and how to engage in our community and just over lunch having some ideas about how to build deeper community. You're going to hear that over and over again with everything we do. How do we build community? How do we let this community where we've been planted know that we love them? Well, it's an ongoing conversation with many of you. I've had it with Don and Judy, lots of people. And one day, Lisa Greer and I were talking and about the children, and she said, you know, what, what if we were to offer yoga to the kids, for the Mother's Day Out kids? And I'm like, I'll have to ask OJ about that. That's a really cool idea. In less than 24 hours, Shannon Zartman posted on Facebook about yoga for her children and an organization that was doing it. Coincidence, another C word, this one, coincidence, it's a coincidence. Thursday we were having lunch, and I, not having vacation Bible school, but we want to do something for the kids this year. What could we do to bring some kids in and have some fun? We said, well, I said, well what do y'all think about a block party? I would love to have a block party that started at the red light and went up to Meridian's red light, and we just get everybody right along on Chapman Highway to get involved and have us a big block party. I think that's a good idea. It's a lot of work. We'd have to really start working hard now. Less than 12 hours, my favorite coffee shop across the street here posted on Facebook that on June the 26th, I believe it's the next end of the month, Saturday meal. On June the 26th, guess what they're going to do? They're going to have a block party. Now, guess who I'm having lunch with on Tuesday morning? Already contacted her. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Worshiping Him, being a part of this community and serving should be fun. I can't wait to see what ideas you have about how we can have fun and continue to connect with our community. May you go in the peace and the knowledge that you are never alone. God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. May you go in his peace. Amen.